Welcome to our next discipleship class and the Bible made clear. So last time we left off with number five and had gone through the expected testimony that we would get regarding evidence for the reliability of the New Testament. So here we are going to jump into extra biblical or outside the Bible testimony uh, that gives us an indication of information that's outside the Bible to corroborate and confirm what the Bible is stating. Now, I think we need to remember as we go through this that the Bible is its own historical document with eyewitness details, and so they are an eyewitness account. Um, we do this in order to um, just demonstrate to those that are either skeptically minded or, or basically against the Bible uh, that it is certainly uh, a valid piece of historical data. There is historicity to it, um, and it's valid. However, at the same time, uh, you know, for those of you who are believers, this certainly will strengthen your faith because a lot of times um, we take the Bible, uh, which is great. We believe it for what it is, and um, but we don't always know what's kind of behind the covers in a sense that connects the dots for us and substantiates it. So um, <clears throat> we do need to believe things that have evidence, and there is uh, plenty of evidence, remarkably so, that the Bible is a valid piece of history. So uh, as we go through this, hopefully any questions that you do have will be answered regarding it. So Flavius Josephus, uh, in his Antiquities of the Jews, um, mentions uh, a number of things that address uh, either Bible characters or Bible incidents, and uh, so he is good to draw on. He was a contemporary of the time. He was a Jew that basically wrote history for the Romans. So he says, um, now there was about, now there was about the time Jesus, a, a wise man, uh, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared unto them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. So this is not the only time that Josephus mentions Jesus um, as an extra-biblical writer. Again, he says, uh, Festus was now dead and Albinus was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of James, who was called Christ, whose name was James and some others, or some of his companions, in other words. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Now, so this is validating uh, not only Jesus' existence, but his half-brother James, okay, and uh, who was really the pastor of the Jerusalem church. We find that out in the book of Acts. And so um, uh, Aeneas uh, was the high priest, and he took advantage of the three-month gap between the death of Festus, who's mentioned in the book of Acts, and uh, Albinus, who had not yet made it to Judea to take his place. So there was a, a leadership gap there for the Romans. The New Testament indicates that James was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, a difficult position to have if Jesus didn't exist. So um, this would answer how that actually happened and the occasion that the Jews took uh, to kill James. Um, we also have an ossuary, um, that references James, the son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Um, and this is dated between 20 B.C. and 70 A.D. So it's 
um, actually right in the, the time frame that James would have lived and died. Um, Josephus said James was executed in 62 AD, uh, and it was unusual to have the brother of a deceased listed on the inscription. Obviously, Jesus was a little unique during that time, so that's probably why he was listed. Uh, there was a court case that actually verified the authenticity um, of this ossuary uh, in 2008 because of the skeptics that were um, coming against it. So, the basic New Testament storyline is confirmed by non-Christian sources. In other words, you get through reading the New Testament and then you read these non-Christian sources and you realize they're kind of giving you the basics of the storyline of the New Testament. Uh, there are 10 ancient non-Christian sources that include historians such as Josephus, uh, Tacitus, Suetonius, Thallus, and Phlegon. Um, there were government officials, Pliny the Younger, Emperor Trajan, and Emperor Hadrian. There were other sources, including the Jewish Talmud and the Greek Rite of Lucian. Uh, and you compile their references, and we get a story that's congruent with the New Testament. Uh, Jesus lived during the time of Tiberius Caesar, and this is all from their writings. He lived a virtuous life. He was a wonder worker. He had a brother named James. He was acclaimed to be the Messiah. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. An eclipse and earthquake occurred when he died. He was crucified on the eve of the Passover. His disciples believed he rose from the dead. His disciples were willing to die for their belief. Christianity spread rapidly as far as Rome. His disciples denied the Roman gods and worshipped Jesus as God, which created a lot of the difficulty. And this is what the New Testament says, really without ever reading the New Testament. You, you kind of get the, those pieces that uh, correlate to the New Testament storyline. So from I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, it says just how many non-Christian sources are there that mention Jesus? Including Josephus, there are 10 known non-Christian writers who mention Jesus within 150 years of his life. By contrast, over the same 150 years, there are nine non-Christian sources who mention Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor at the time of Jesus. So discounting all the Christian sources, Jesus is actually mentioned by one more source than the Roman emperor. If you include the Christian sources, authors mentioning Jesus outnumber those mentioning Tiberius 43 to 10. Some of these non-Christian sources such as Celsius, Tacitus, and the Jewish Talmud could be considered anti-Christian sources since they were against him. So we have the uh, Pilate stone right on the, the inscription. It was discovered in 1961, uh, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. And again, they dated it between 26 and 37 A.D. Jesus' crucifixion would have been basically right in about the middle of that. Uh, so Frank Turek, he will give us a good explanation of that uh, on the next slide. Another biblical character we know who existed via archaeology is Pontius Pilate. In 1961, in the coastal town of Caesarea in northern Israel, a stone was discovered which says Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. We not only know he existed from this stone, but Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived from 37 AD to about 100 AD, mentions Pontius Pilate in his writings. He also mentions Jesus. He also mentions James and John the Baptist and some other characters in the Bible. We know these people actually existed from archaeology, some of them, and also from writers like Josephus. So that was good. Um, moving on to some other evidence, we have the ossuary of Joseph Caiaphas, right? He was the high priest from 18 to 36, and it was discovered in 1990. And <clears throat> that's the inscription on the end magnified there. Again, 
Frank Turek will give us a good explanation. One of the most fascinating archaeological discoveries which authenticates a major character in the Bible is the Caiaphas ossuary. This was discovered in 1990 in Jerusalem. What's an ossuary? It's a limestone box that the Jews used from about 20 BC to 70 AD. What would happen if somebody important died? They would inter the body about a year later. They would take the bones out of the grave and put them in this ossuary, this limestone box, and reinter the remains. Well, in 1990, they discovered this very ornate ossuary that on the side of it identified the remains as the remains of Caiaphas. Who is Caiaphas? He was the high priest that sentenced Jesus to die. When Jesus said, I am the Messiah, and you will see the Son of Man coming with great power on the clouds, Caiaphas tore his robe and said, blasphemy, this man must die. The man that sentenced Jesus to die, we not only know he existed, we have his bones. When they discovered this ossuary, they discovered the bones of a 60-year-old man and his family. There's only one Caiaphas known from history, and that's the Caiaphas of the New Testament who, who sentenced Jesus to die. We not only know he existed, we have his burial box. We also have the Pool of Bethesda. Uh, excavations have found the five porches, colonnades, located a short distance from the Sheep Gate as described in John 5.2, which is basically where a bunch of people were lame and sick and waiting for the water to be troubled so that they could get down there and get healed. Uh, we also have um, the evidence of crucifixion that was discovered in 1968, uh, also of that time frame, and um, you know you'll get uh, an explanation on the next slide of that. Welcome to Expedition Bible. I'm Joel Kramer. Today I'm going to be talking about the archaeological evidence for crucifixion. In the New Testament, we have a detailed account of Jesus' crucifixion. And for example, in Acts 2.23, it says of Jesus, they put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Is there any archaeological evidence that the Romans put Jews to death by nailing them to crosses? In 1968, in the northeast area of Jerusalem, a tomb was discovered and excavated. And inside this tomb was found one of these limestone bone boxes called an ossuary. And inside of the ossuary were found the remains, according to the excavation report, of an individual male between 24 and 28 years old. Now, according to the excavation report, both of the ankle bones of this individual had been pierced by an iron nail, and this undoubtedly was a case of crucifixion. In fact, uh, one of the heel bones of this individual had a nail still embedded through it. We know the name of this individual because it's inscribed onto the ossuary itself. His name is Yehohanan. And so uh, this embedded nail through Yehohanan's ankle is on display at the Israel Museum, but this is a replica. The real artifact is kept in a lab down in the Department of Anatomy and Anthropology at the University of Tel Aviv, where it's still studied by scholars today. And if you look at the nail sticking through Yehohanan's ankle bone, you'll see that the tip is bent. And what is believed to have happened is that when it was driven through his ankle into the wooden beam, it hit a knot of wood and that bent the tip of the nail. So when the Romans came to retrieve the nail to reuse it, it was stuck. And they ended up having to cut it out of the wood and uh, so Yehohanan ended up being buried with the nail still sticking through his ankle, which allowed this archeological evidence to be preserved and to be found later by archeologists. The drawing of Yehohanan uh, is only of his lower half because it's undetermined how his hands were attached to the cross. 
However, we know uh, from the archaeological evidence that his feet were nailed to either side of the beam of the cross through his ankle bones. So there's no question that Yehohanan ended his life nailed to a cross. In 1970, another tomb nearby this first one was discovered and excavated, and inside of it also was found an ossuary. And inside of this ossuary, three iron nails were found with bones still fused to them. So these bones were originally turned over to Dr. Niku Haas, who was the leading physical anthropologist in Israel at the time. He studied them and determined that this was further evidence for crucifixion that this individual, who he determined to be about a 25-year-old male, ended his life nailed to a cross through his hands, and it was his hand bones that were still fused onto these nails. Now, these nails are also kept at the same lab down at the University of Tel Aviv, and they have been studied today by Dr. Israel Hershkovitz. And Dr. Hershkovitz has studied them intensively under a very high-powered microscope and he has determined that when the nails were driven through this individual's hands that it broke some of the hand bones and it's the bones from his hand bones that are fused still to these nails. Dr. Hershkovitz is in agreement with the original interpretation by Dr. Haas that this is in fact further evidence of crucifixion that this individual died being nailed to the cross through his hands. Now, in this case, they're not sure how his feet were attached to the cross. And so we have the illustration based on the archaeological evidence showing the upper part of uh, this man's body and how his hands were nailed to the cross. So when we bring these two illustrations together, we get this composite view of a crucified man from the first century AD, the time of Jesus, based on archaeological evidence of what crucifixion looked like at that time. And it matches perfectly with the descriptions that we have in the New Testament of Jesus' crucifixion. Again, Acts 2.23 says that they put him to death by nailing him to the cross. We also have after his resurrection in John 20, 25, the disciple Thomas who felt the nail marks in his hands where the nails were. And so this image that we have of Jesus nailed to a cross through his hands and his feet is supported by the archeological evidence. I think that uh, Joel does a great job there. Um, I'd recommend going out to uh, his website. Uh, he's got quite a bit of information out there as far as uh, archaeological finds and explanations. I think you'd enjoy it if you're interested in that. So <clears throat> moving along, we now come to our last number seven, which is elaborate testimony. So just lying below the surface of the New Testament uh, narrative is an elaborate series of interlocking puzzle pieces that reveal that the New Testament documents uh, contain independent eyewitness of actual historical events. Details in one writer's account inadvertently fill in the gaps of another writer's account. I say inadvertently because these details are too small, uh, I'm sorry, too subtle, too elaborate and widespread to have been planned or contrived. Um, Cambridge professor J.J. Blunt uh, identified over 
60 of these instances in the New Testament alone and called them undesigned coincidences. Now, this is from Stealing from God, um, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case by Frank Turek. That's his quote. Um, and by the way, this book by Professor Blunt is available on, um, on the Internet. So um, at archive.org, you can just search for it and then uh, you can download it as a PDF if you're interested in, again, getting more information and, and reading about it. So, Jesus and Pilate. Um, again, this is from um, Stealing from God by Frank Turek. So, um, he has in there that Luke records the Jews and this is one of the undesigned coincidences out of Blunt's book. Uh, he's just kind of fabricated it uh, so that it'll be easy for us to follow. So Luke records the Jews bringing accusations against Pilate, uh, Jesus to Pilate. We found, and this is the quote, right? We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ the king. Pilate asked, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. So the emphasis is in red. And um, obviously this doesn't make a lot of sense because why would Pilate just say uh, to some competing king that I don't find any fault with him? So um, the answer right? This is the puzzle. Jesus admits he's guilty as charged, so why does Pilate say he's not guilty? And this is the baffling part, but the answer is underneath the covers. And I, I think, um, you know, these examples will provide some um, small example microcosm of what is all over the New Testament because, and the Old Testament, by the way, because a lot of times people criticize the Bible by taking a verse, they take just the words of the verse and they find words someplace else in the Bible that seem to conflict with it, ignoring the context, ignoring basically the rest of the Bible, and then um, assume that somehow the Bible is in conflict with itself when it isn't. And so um, these questions get answered in other places. Now, obviously, if you believe the Bible, you realize that uh, the Holy Spirit is the one that's moving the writers to put pieces into place. But when you have realistic eyewitnesses, you always have on the surface what can appear to be an apparent conflict. I mean, um, detectives deal with this all the time. If you've watched any kind of actual like cold case detective show or anything else like that, um, you know, as you're going through the show, I mean, you, you think one person's guilty because that's kind of where the evidence seems to be leading. But then they find out other pieces that connect underneath what's on the surface. And it's really somebody else that does it. And uh, this is just this is common among actual eyewitness evidence. So the puzzle piece, it's only baffling until you read John's account. Pilate entered his Headquarters again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Keep peace. Pilate went back outside of the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Again, the emphasis is added. So if you put the pieces together, John offers information not provided by Luke. Since Jesus said his kingdom is not of this world, he was not challenging Caesar's rule as accused. Therefore, Pilate found no guilt in him. Again, once you have all the pieces, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but sometimes people actually can read right past that and not even think about it. But, um, you know, Blunt had apparently thought about it. And, um, you know, he put it down, put at least 60 of them for the New Testament down in a book. 
Uh, this kind of testimony reveals the veracity of the New Testament writers. Eyewitness testimony always has to be investigated uh, to discover the interlocking pieces, no different than a real-life crime scene. For example, they can initially appear to be possible contradictions on the surface. This reveals the writers were not in collusion. Uh, each writer, uh, the Gospels in our case, must be analyzed to discover the pieces needed to clear up questions. This reveals the writers were most likely unaware that they were missing pieces uh, that were missing pieces really in their own eyewitness description or were unconcerned about them. Sometimes they don't write things down because as they were writing to a culture that would understand certain things, they just make the assumption. Um, and that's easy to do in any writing. Number three, connections many times require a knowledge of customs or culture in the time of the writing. This reveals the writers assume the readers would have some knowledge of the details. Like I said, number four, each New Testament writer provides information that is only a piece of information that is not always necessarily of high value to their own account, but when analyzed, answers to other eyewitness accounts. Uh, this reveals it was unplanned details for it makes, uh, that should be no sense, not not sense, uh, no sense to require the eyewitness account of an other to clear up any perceived missing pieces to a story. Um, this is how legitimate eyewitness accounts actually occur, like we're, I was mentioning to you. With the sheer number of these in the New Testament alone, it would be impossible to pre-plan all underlying pieces and have them fit unless they were actual eyewitness accounts. <laughs> Let's look at some interlocking puzzle pieces from non-Christian writers. This is sometimes called extra-biblical writers or extra-biblical testimony. So these aren't people writing in the Bible. These are people like Josephus and Tacitus and Suetonius. These are writers who lived around that time who are giving us details about that era. And let's start in Matthew. Why avoid Herod Archelaus? Who is Archelaus? Archelaus is one of the sons of Herod the Great. When Herod the Great died in 6 BC, his kingdom was divided up, and one of his sons was Archelaus. And Archelaus got the section of the kingdom that included Jerusalem. And uh, so he was the ruler from 4 BC to about 6 AD, so about 10 years. And as you read Matthew, he leaves a puzzle, because here's what Matthew records that Joseph had a dream in Egypt to return to Israel with Mary and the child Jesus. But when Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Now, Galilee is to the north in Israel. And of course, Jerusalem is the area whereby Archelaus is in charge or where Archelaus is in charge. There is no explanation as to who Archelaus is. There's no explanation as to why Joseph would want to avoid this area. So it seems to me the puzzle is this. Why is Archelaus so scary? Somebody not in the Bible tells us. In fact, this man is the greatest Jewish historian of the time. His name is Titus Josephus. He lived from 37 AD to, AD to 100 AD. And uh, he was one of the rebels against the Romans in 66 A.D., when the Jews tried to boot the Romans out, that did not end well. Because what happened in 70 A.D.? The temple and the entire country basically was overrun by the Romans, and the temple has not been rebuilt to this day. So when Jesus says to them in, in Matthew chapter 24 that not one stone will be left upon another, and then they ask him, well, when, is the, when are these things going to occur? And he says, before this generation passes away, these things are going to occur. He says, you will see the Son of Man coming in power on the clouds. And everyone's thinking that's a reference to the end of the world. No, it's not. It's a reference to 70 A.D. He said that in 30 A.D. What's a generation? 40 years. 40 years later, 70 A.D., 
the Roman army descends upon Jerusalem and they wipe out Jerusalem. They wipe out the temple. Josephus said there was nothing left. Now, what's all this business about coming in the clouds? What could you see? By the way, Jerusalem's elevated. What could you see from 100 miles if an army was coming on Jerusalem? A cloud of dust. In fact, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 19, it says Yahweh rides a cloud of judgment against Egypt. The reference to the clouds is the, the army coming. Jesus is saying that Jerusalem would be judged because they rejected the Messiah within a generation. And there it was. This guy talks about it in a couple of works that he has done. One is called Antiquities. And here's what he says about Archelaus. Matthew doesn't explain, but the Jewish historian Josephus does in putting out a disturbance at the temple in 4 BC, so he's just taken over, Archelaus sent in troops into the temple and slaughtered 3,000 Jews. Passover that year was canceled. He tries to assert his authority as soon as he takes over. He murders 3,000 Jews. They cancel Passover. A whole bunch of Jews are probably going back on the road toward Egypt. And Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus are on their way back going, where are you guys going? Isn't it Passover? Archelaus, he, haven't you heard? He just slaughtered 3,000 of our brethren. Passover's been canceled. So <laughs> what do you, what's Joseph doing? I'm not going to where that homicidal maniac is. I just left that area to escape a homicidal maniac. His father, I'm not going back there. I'm going to go to Galilee. right? But you don't get that from the Bible. You get that from Josephus. And Josephus is writing about 40 years after this. So here comes an outside source, Josephus, and he says Matthew is reliable. Next one, number two. Why did they take Jesus to the temple when he was 12? Why not 10? Why not 11? In fact, if you look at Luke, he raises a question. It says, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Every year, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom, and they took Jesus with them. And you know the rest of the story. He's found in the temple after they... And by, what, by the way, isn't this just like about 12-year-old kids? You know, when you go in a group with their friends, you're thinking, well, their parents are watching him. And their parents are thinking, well, you... <laughs> You're watching his kid, you know, and somehow Jesus gets left out of the whole gaggle. And he's in the temple and nobody notices it until they're halfway home. Where's Jesus? I thought he was with you. No, no, I thought he was with you. Where is he? And they go back and they find him in the temple. But why would they go down there when he's 12? Why not 11? Why not 10? Why not 13? Why 12? And why did his parents go without him until 12? Again, Josephus may answer the question. In the 10th year of Archelaus' government, both his brethren and the principal men of Judea and Samaria, not being able to bear his barbarous and tyrannical usage of them, accused him before Caesar. Caesar, upon hearing what certain accusers of his, uh, of his had to say and what reply he could make, banished Archelaus to a city in Gaul, which is present-day France. So the people basically rebelled against Archelaus by going to Caesar and saying, this guy's a psycho. We want somebody else. And so they hear all this. Caesar does, and he says, Archelaus, what do you have to say for yourself? Apparently, Archelaus did not do a good job in defense. You're gone. He took all his property from him, sent him to France. What year was that? That's about the time Jesus would have been 12. You say, wasn't Jesus born in zero? First of all, there's no, there's no zero year, okay? But no, the way the calendar goes, he was born around 6 B.C., sometime between 4 and 6 B.C., okay? So why did they bring him when he's 12? Because Archelaus is gone. Archelaus is no longer a threat. So they avoided bringing Jesus into Archelaus' territory when Archelaus was there. As soon as they figured out that Archelaus is gone, he's deposed, he's in France, I guess it's safe to take the boy down to Jerusalem. Let's go. Now, is that a little bit of speculation? Yeah, but it's quite interesting, isn't it? In fact, now you've got Josephus also now verifying Luke. So I include that in there because I think that um, it's 
again, it, it kind of combines two things. It gives you the um, extra biblical testimony uh, contributing to the elaborate testimony. Um, and again, uh, th there are a number of things, a number of things like that that occur. So uh, interweaving between two historical documents um, is a normal thing to do to discover why things may have occurred the way that they did. So, so there's nothing abnormal about that. Um, the only thing that we need to recognize is that the New Testament is just as valid or actually because of how it was put together, how it was transmitted and uh, the volume of it and the testimony towards it to people outside of it that copied it and everything else and promoted it. Um, it is actually a more verifiable um, ancient document than even Josephus. So, um just interesting as we go through that. So let's answer some critics on the New Testament. Um, it's the next place to go. The charge that the New Testament manuscripts have multiple errors is a misleading statement, though factually correct. What do the facts tell us? Number one, any variance in spelling of words are considered an error. We've gone through that. There are 150 to 200,000 variants over... 26,000 uh, partial manuscripts of the New Testament, depending upon uh, the scholars referenced. And so, you know, you get a little bit plus or minus that number. Of these variants, there are only 50 of the errors or so-called errors uh, that have any real significance. In other words, that call into question maybe what the exact sentence is is saying uh, do we take it this way or that way uh, but none of them affect any doctrine in other words um, when you get on the list of christian doctrines we believe this we believe this we believe this none of them are contrary to that um, so 99 percent of the new testament copies um, i'm sorry of the variances really hold no significance at all there are 36,000 uh, plus quotes from the early church fathers that the New Testament can be assembled from with only 11 verses not quoted. And we, again, we went through that. So these are the facts. Uh, let's see how the majority of errors are documented, right? So here's an example of the majority of errors, um, how they, what they represent. So we could have uh, a sentence like this in one, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world, right? No D on the end. Um, Christ Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. Jesus Christ, right, with the S after it, um, but no I for the is, the Savior of the whole world. And then Jesus Christ is the without the E, Savior of the, and then whole without the O, world. But, um, and then the, the fifth example, but these, this is an example of a modern comparison of how the errors typically occur. So the, the, the New Testament, the majority of the errors are very similar to this, right? Um, here's a modern example of what you would see right you know you have the you have won 10 million dollars but you you have no o in the u you have no u in the u you have no h in the right so even with the mistakes 100 percent of the message comes through and actually with more copies and the mistakes kind of moving around and the misspellings you are more and more and more sure of exactly what it says so the errors are not a detriment they're actually like, like we had talked about earlier, uh, they are help because they, they help um, those that are study in this discipline. It tells them geographies where manuscripts come from. It's a, they're able to trace it like with a postage stamp in a sense, uh, going through different post offices. They can trace it with either uh, words that are spelled in a particular way that are wrong or uh, things that are missing in the text as they're copied. So the more errors, the more sure you are really of the message. 
really, who would not collect their money in that example? Statistics can be deceitful if used deceitfully. Uh, you have won $10 million. Uh, thou, hast won ten, uh, thou hast won $10 million. Y'all have won $10 million, right? Uh, of the 27 letters in line two, only seven are the same in line three. In other words, only 26% are the same, yet the message is 100% identical. So variance in spelling, sentences that are a little disjointed or not written well or anything like that um, does not necessarily mean that we, are, we do not know what the New Testament original documents said because the copies are fully adequate. Uh, they are different in form but not content. And even with the many differences, 100% of the message comes through. And that's really what we have with the New Testament. Many New Testament variations, uh, many of the New Testament variations are just like this, right? Simon Wenham uh, answers five uh, strongest arguments against the reliability of the New Testament. Uh, they're briefed here. Uh, there was a full article in 2019 uh, uh, the Zacharias Trust magazine. So objection one, he brings up the New Testament uh, was written decades after Jesus' death, and we don't know who some of the authors were. Answer, uh, there is a very good case for accepting the earliest description of Mark's gospel to Mark, uh, a companion of Peter and Paul, and of Luke's to Luke, Paul's companion. If you wanted to invent an author for these important records, you would surely go for people more directly linked to Jesus, such as Peter. Um, I think that's obvious, so I think Wenham does a good job here. It is wrong to consider that there was a gap between the events of Jesus' lifetime and the writing of the Gospels. During those years, um, if the first Christians were crisscrossing the Greco-Roman world telling people about Jesus and inviting them to believe in him. So, um, look, I think, you know, we're kind of uh, pounding the same issue here, but um, there's really no good reason to believe that uh, the first objection has any legitimacy to it at all. Additionally, for further research, you can uh, look at, um, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, um, and they give some great information in chapters 9 through 11 regarding that. Chapter 9 is entitled, Do We Have Early Testimony About Jesus? Right, And it answers specifically the New Testament manuscripts and their early witness earlier than any other historical document in history. Again, we went through that, that detail. Chapter 10, do we have eyewitness testimony about Jesus? Uh, this chapter examines Colin Hemmer's book and the particular evidence that proves eyewitness testimony. And then chapter 11, the top 10 reasons we know the New Testament writers told the truth. This details the unlikely reasons why the New Testament writers would be fabricating the stories they wrote about the evidence. So that would be a great additional resource for you. Objection two that Wenham brings up. <clears throat> um, it is full of mistakes and the accounts don't even agree with each other. Answer, the differences between the gospel accounts have long been recognized by scholars and a vast amount has been written on how and why this is the case. Having different witnesses is important as in the court of law. If all the witnesses said exactly the same thing, then we might well suspect that they had colluded. But if they came at things from different angles, then their combined testimony is all the stronger. Um, though skeptics would like to say that they're in contradiction, uh, you can't win with a skeptic. It's either collusion or contradiction. Uh, so there's no, there's no middle ground with them. But anyways, Luke shows that he was interested in historical events. Further, other information he has given has been substantiated, such as his description of 
Gallio as the governor of Corinth and confirmed by an inscription found in the Greek city of Delphi. So there's your archaeological evidence. Additional resource, Colin Hemmer's book, The Book of Acts, in the setting of Hellenistic history, right? So if you're interested in that, you know, we kind of flew through those 84 facts, but uh, Hemmer's book will detail all those out. And Professor Blunt's book that I had mentioned uh, in this video, um, this part, uh, because it's free, it's available online, you can go through that with the undesigned coincidences. Easy for me to say. Objection three, there are no external records to corroborate it, meaning the New Testament. Answer, there is external evidence of interest. Josephus, Jewish Roman historian, which we saw some quotes from, is a highly significant witness, although his reference to Jesus may have been altered he provided a wealth of information about the religious climate of the time, as well as some of the individuals mentioned in the Bible, ranging from uh, the Pharisees and Herod to Pilate and John the Baptist. Now, it may have been altered, and there may be some indication of that, but it was there. That's the point. Um, so you don't mention people that don't exist. There are also other types of external sources that corroborate details within the Bible, including the archaeological finds of the Pool of Siloam. Uh, we looked at that, um, an inscription referring to Pilate, the bones of Caiaphas, also geographical evidence that fits what the Bible describes. So for further research, again, this is a table, and I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, and it gives you the non-Christian writers, and what uh, areas of the Bible that they addressed. Objection four, they are highly biased documents uh, that were only selected by the church later on. Answer, there is no doubt that the authors were enthusiastic believers who wanted to persuade others. Uh, they weren't journalists, okay, um, but if someone ardently believes something, it does not follow that they will therefore distort the truth. On the contrary, the strength of their feeling is likely to be a reflection of the degree to which they believe it to be true, as well as the importance they attach to it. Furthermore, the Gospels contain various things that the writers might have been expected to hush up, such as the very blunt portrayal of the disciples' failures, like Peter's disowning Jesus. There are other signs of authenticity, too, like the portrayal of women as the first witnesses to Jesus' resurrection, not something likely to be invented in a male-dominated culture. And again, we, we went through that in the embarrassing details, and that's what Wenham is mentioning here. For additional research, chapter 11, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, going through the embarrassing details. Uh, and then... Um, Later century manuscripts of the New Testament text cannot change earlier ones from the first and second century. Church councils didn't alter what was written and kept the same New Testament books as passed down from the first century. Had they wanted to alter the New Testament in any way, they were a miserable failure because they kept embarrassing details that remain in the text until the current time. These details no one would include if they were altering the text. And you can't go back and alter these manuscripts. That is such an absurd claim. That is only made by people that are um, phenomenally ignorant of history, the New Testament, and ancient literature in general. Uh, there's just no way to do that. It's not like you can go in and start uh, deleting um, and altering stuff on a computer. This stuff was in... Um, you know, papyrus or animal vellum it was written on. It wasn't like they went in there and started erasing and changing and um, and then had to corroborate with people in other areas of the ancient world. That, that's, that's so absurd. I don't even know, even know um, why it becomes an issue. Number five, miracles don't happen. The answer, history may not be able to tell us whether something had an, a supernatural cause but it can help us assess whether it is likely to have occurred. To dismiss the first Christians as ancient people who believed anything and everything is insulting and completely unsatisfactory. They knew as well as we do that the um, 
uh, executed people remain dead. Uh, the idea that a hallucination persuaded them otherwise or indeed uh, that they perpetuated a giant fraud is not pers uh, persuasive. The much simpler and straightforward explanation is that those who claim to have seen Jesus after his death had indeed done so. The suspicion must be that much modern skepticism arises out of a questionable naturalistic philosophy rather than out of serious study of the New Testament. So if you're just going to define miracles out of existence from the beginning, then you'll seek to find out, uh, find some explanation, whether it's absurd or not, why Jesus didn't rise from the dead and ignore all the evidence. Um, so the evidence is there. And again, we know that if you're dealing with evidence accurately, then just like in a crime situation, you're more likely to catch, you know, the criminal. Uh, if you just ignore evidence and you have a bias, well, that's how the wrong people get put in jail or you never solve the crime because you're always off on a wild goose chase. Additional research for that. Again, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Chapter 11 and the explanation again of later centuries. So in conclusion, uh, the New Testament history is reliable. Uh, it is fact, not fiction. It is accurate early eyewitness testimony. The documents and events recorded accurately. We saw that in transmission. More manuscript support than any other historical document. I mean, that that's, again, these are all factual pieces. Earlier manuscript support than any other historical document. So there's not, not only more, but they were earlier. And if it says Jesus said it, then Jesus really said it. That's the bottom line. And if Jesus did it, then Jesus really did it. So that is the end of um, the New Testament aspect. The New Testament is reliable. So um, that's the end, at least in, in this. So we'll continue on um, in our next study with moving into uh, the other um, on go forward on the list of, until we complete the 12. Uh, steps that show that um, Christianity is true. So uh, until then, until next time, may God richly bless you as you continue to study his word.